the early morning hours of November the 11th, 1988, Byron Carr was strangled to death in his home in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, or PEI, Canada. Byron's murder remains unsolved to this day and is actually Prince Edward Island's only unsolved murder. Just imagine the shock and horror when Byron's sister, Maida, found his body strangled by a towel with a knife protruding from his stomach and a message written on the wall that read, I will kill again. What the hell was going on? This was small town PEI. Murders just don't happen here. Then imagine the shock again to only find out that Byron Carr was a gay man leading a somewhat secret, risque sexual life. You have to remember that this was 1988, and it was PEI, and these things just didn't happen. There couldn't be a gay community. Swinging bisexual parties? No way. This was conservative PEI. At least that's what people wanted to believe. It never ceases to amaze that a murder can go unsolved in such a small community where most everybody knows everybody, or at least have mutual acquaintances. It is really quite baffling that a secret this big can stay buried for so long. There must be those in the community who know what happened, but for whatever reason, they refuse to come forward. Charlottetown is the capital of PEI, which is Canada's smallest province. PEI has the lowest violent crime rate of any province in Canada. And to just kind of put it into context how small PEI actually is, in 1988, the province of PEI had a total population of around 129,000 people. Meanwhile, the population of Charlottetown was just only about 15,000. PEI is an island on Canada's east coast, which is known for its beautiful scenery that is marked by red sand beaches, lighthouses, and fertile farmland. PEI is also renowned for seafood, like lobster and mussels. Byron Carr was a popular and inspirational 36-year-old teacher who was very involved with and cared about his students. Byron was described by his friends, the Van Dykes, as a happy person who loved to help them on their farm. Byron himself had grew up on a farm, and he came from a well-respected family. Of average height, Byron was a handsome man, but one who had a secret side to him that he kept hidden from most people. Byron was gay. And like I said, you have to remember that this was back in the 80s, and being openly gay was not accepted very well, especially in such a small place as PEI. But, quote, he was outed by his death, unquote, said Charlottetown Deputy Chief Brad McConnell, who would go on to reopen Byron's cold case in 2007. Allegedly, Byron had been living a risque lifestyle that sometimes flirted with danger. A man who was too afraid to be identified told a reporter in a 1993 documentary, Who Killed Byron Carr, that Byron had propositioned him in the year before he died, in 1987, to attend sex parties at his house. Though he did not attend the parties himself, he claims that Byron talked a few times to him about these parties. They were swinger parties, where men and women got together and shared sexual escapades. Byron told this man that some prominent people would attend these parties, and he also revealed that sometimes the sessions were videotaped or pictures were taken. And allegedly, a high-ranking police officer was placed at these parties. Byron was also known to cruise the Queen Square area of Charlottetown for men for sexual encounters in the early morning hours after his friends went home. Byron seemed to be acting different to his close friends and family in the few months that led up to his murder. It seemed that something was bothering him. And one mentionable act was when it came out that Byron had taken $6,000 of money that was raised by his school's yearbook committee, in which Byron chaired. 
Byron left his job when this came out. And many people wonder what could have made Byron do something like that since it was so uncharacteristic for his personality. Friends report that after Byron left his job, he became more and more immersed in activities with friends that he had mostly met at bars and parties. Byron's favorite bars at the time were Chevy's and the Charlottetown Hotel, as well as Pat's Rose and Gray. Pat's was a popular bar for men to come and meet other men. Another strange incident was when Byron told his close friend how in the few months leading up to his murder that a man was phoning him. It appeared to Byron that this man wanted some sort of relationship with him, but Byron was not comfortable with this and didn't want to be associated with this person. Byron's friend remembers that Byron told her one night when he fell asleep on his couch, he woke up and this man was in his house. And though it did seem that this bothered Byron some, he claimed that the guy was harmless. Due to the era when this murder occurred and the topic of homosexuality being, I guess you could say, taboo, Byron's case was awkward for the local media to cover and the gay community was shrouded in secrecy because back then people simply were just not out about their sexuality. It was very sensational that not only was this PEI's first unsolved murder in recent times, but it was also the murder of a gay man, and that forced people to talk about uncomfortable things that were happening behind closed doors, so to speak. As we know, the first few days after a murder are crucial in investigations. This is when police need to talk to witnesses, they need to gather information about the victim, and the people close to them. But in Byron's murder investigation, however, police were met mostly with silence. Quote, I don't think this case was given the same level of sympathy from our community as others have, unquote, said Deputy Chief McConnell. Byron was killed following what police believe was a consensual sexual encounter with another man at a time when he and many other gay men kept their sexuality a secret. Quote, that sensationalism at the time, when we were living in a different time in our culture, caused people some apprehension to want to get involved, unquote, said Deputy Chief McConnell. Contributing to this silence was the lack of trust by many in the gay community that they had towards the police. As well, there was the fear among the gay community that a serial killer was on the loose and that maybe speaking with the police as a witness could be potentially setting themselves up as the killer's next target. A detailed timeline of Byron's last night has been outlined by police. Some events of this night would not come out until decades later, as some witnesses were just too afraid to talk. They risked exposing their own secrets as well as becoming a potential target for a deranged killer. On Thursday, November the 10th at 8 p.m., Byron had dinner with a female friend at a restaurant in Charlottetown. He was home again by 9.30. At around 9.30, a couple of Byron's friends, the Van Dykes, came over for coffee. They said while they were there, Byron had gotten a few phone calls. The Van Dykes then left by 11.45. On Friday, November the 11th at 12 a.m., just a few minutes after the Van Dykes had left, Byron went to Pat's bar. The bartender at Pat's remembers Byron's group of friends that night was going bar hopping. And among Byron's friends that night was Ted Gallant and Owen Aylward. The bartender recalls that it was a strange night. It almost felt like there was a full moon out or something and there were strange people around that night. For instance, one fellow came in dressed in all black with a black hat on, and he ended up having words with one of the workers and left the bar. This guy was known around town as a strange guy, and his name was Ernie Much. Soon after this happened, Byron, Ted Gallant, and Owen Aylward went to a small seedy bar named Bud's. While they were there, 
Owen had noticed that someone was staring at him, and again, it was Ernie Much. Owen recalls that Byron said, Oh, I know him. He's a really nice guy. And Byron proceeded to call Ernie over. Then they all started hanging out, and eventually the group ended up at Chevy's bar, where Ernie Much would then split from the group. Byron and his two buddies, Ted and Owen, left the bar well after 2 a.m. Byron drove his friends to his home, Ted fell asleep on the couch, and Owen and Byron talked for a while. Byron insisted that his friends stay the night, but Owen had obligations the next day and he had to leave. So he woke Ted up and they both left before 3 a.m. By 3 a.m., Byron was on the move again. He drove south on University Avenue. He picked up a male friend who was walking at the corner of University and Houston. He dropped this friend off at a boarding house. And then by 3.05 a.m., a witness years later would come forward to say that he seen Byron parked talking to a man on a bicycle at Prince and Richmond Streets. Byron pulled away, driving north up Prince Street in the direction of his house. The man on the bike then appeared to follow Byron. This witness sighting was not reported until 20 years after the murder. And this sighting is the last known sighting of Byron alive. Police believe that the cyclist may be Byron's killer. By 9 a.m. November the 11th, Byron's boarder arrived home. He did not see Byron and noted that his bedroom door was closed. He saw Byron's car in the driveway, and then the boarder left the house and traveled out of town for the long weekend. By 1 p.m., a friend calls Byron, but there is no answer. At 3.30 p.m., another friend drives by Byron's house. He also takes note that Byron's car is in the driveway. By 8 p.m., a friend stopped by Byron's house. He also sees the car in the driveway. He knocks at the front door, but there is no answer. At 8.45 p.m. that night, witnesses report two unknown males acting suspiciously near Byron's house. By 11 p.m., police received a call of a stolen car from 154 Richmond Street. Police would later think it might have a connection to Byron's murder. The stolen car was reported by George Smith, who turns out to be a man that police have never been able to track down. And other than police reporting that they believe the stolen car is somehow related to Byron's murder, what that actually means is not public knowledge. I do not know the connection. Saturday, November 12th at 2.30 a.m., it is believed that the killer returned to Byron's house with an accomplice to clean up and retrieve items that might identify him. Residents in the area reported hearing Byron's dog barking, which wasn't common, and a vehicle leaving the area at a high rate of speed. It was at this time that police believe the message, I will kill again, was written on the wall. It is also believed this is when Byron was stabbed with a long-handled kitchen knife. They also believe this is when Byron's wallet was taken. Police believe the two men were looking for a pair of underwear, which the police would find at the scene. As well, a pair of socks was also left behind in the kitchen garbage. Although the gay community viewed the message on the wall as a warning at the time, Police now believe the message was an act of juvenile behavior or an expression of frustration because the two men were unable to find a key piece of evidence, which was the killer's underwear. At 11 a.m., concerned that Byron had not appeared at a family function, his sister Maida and brother-in-law went to his house. They found the kitchen door was ajar and the dog was in his kennel. Byron's sister found his body in his bedroom. Byron was strangled with a towel in an apparent rough sex encounter with another male. There was no sign of forced entry, which suggests that Byron had invited the killer into his home. As well, there was no apparent evidence of a struggle. 
Therefore, it is believed that it is possible Byron knew and trusted his killer. There was considerable forensic evidence found at the scene, and a strong DNA profile believed to belong to the killer has been compiled. Police still, however, do not know the person's identity. Of the evidence retrieved were two drinking glasses, but unfortunately police could not find any fingerprints. Someone had left a sweater behind at Byron's, and a pair of underwear, like I said, which believed to belong to the killer were found, as well as a pair of socks in the kitchen garbage. From these socks, a DNA profile was collected, but interestingly, it didn't match Byron, the killer, or his accomplice. Police believe the socks actually belonged to a third party that was unrelated to the crime, but were worn by one of the two men to avoid leaving fingerprints during the crime scene cleanup. This DNA from the socks is in a national data bank, but still to today has no match. The underwear that were found are believed to be the killer's. It's Zeller's brand, medium size, bikini style, and fits a 29.5 inch waist. That led police to believe that the killer was of a slight build. On these underwear was the killer's DNA, but also the DNA of a woman, which is why police believe the killer was bisexual. Police would develop a psychological profile of the killer, a repressed homosexual, also very likely bisexual, very dangerous and likely to kill again. The killer was believed to be young, between the ages of 15 to 25 years old, a resident of Charlottetown, and a person having had previous involvement with the police. It's possible that Byron knew him, as well as it's also possible that Byron had met him for the first time that night. Byron's murder went cold, but fortunately was formally reopened in September of 2007 after a guy came forward claiming that he had been attacked not long after Byron's murder. Both attacks shared striking similarities. The unidentified witness, who is gay, told police he picked up a man in a local park two months after Byron was killed. He took this guy home, and after they had consensual sex, the younger man became violent. He grabbed a knife from the kitchen and threatened the witness, saying that he had done this before. The witness fortunately was able to get away. The suspect stole the man's wallet just as Byron's wallet had been stolen. In 2010, authorities released a composite sketch created with the assistance of this 2007 witness, as well as a photo of the underwear that were found at Byron's house. The man in this sketch is described as being about 19 years old in 1988. He was of thin build and average height with auburn brown hair. Police do not know if this sketch actually shows Byron's killer, but because both cases have such striking similarities, police believe that this lead warrants further examination. Describing why it took so long for this witness to come forward, almost 20 years, actually, Deputy Chief McConnell said, quote, This was a secret that he had, and like most gay men at the time, not wanting to be outed, or exposed as being gay, or involved in that kind of behavior, he never reported the incident." Unquote. In 2008, which was 20 years after Byron's murder, another witness would come forward, and this would be the witness that had seen Byron talking to the cyclist on the night that he died. He said Byron was pulled over on the side of the road, and when he left to drive home, the cyclist followed him. Police were skeptical at first, but the man agreed to take a polygraph test to prove that he was telling the truth, and he did pass. Then in November of 2013, there was a major development in Byron's murder, when police announced that they had compelling evidence implicating a second man 
as the accomplice that had helped the murderer clean up the murder scene. Unfortunately, this man had died in the early 2000s, but police say that had he been alive when witnesses spoke up, they would have had enough evidence to arrest him. After his death, two witnesses came forward, separately, one in 2008 and another in 2012. They both told police similar stories, that the man had confessed his role in helping the killer clean up, but the man hadn't revealed the name of the killer to them. The accomplice, says Deputy Chief McConnell, was actually on a short list of suspects early in the investigation. He was 27 at the time of the murder, a native of Charlottetown, he was believed to be bisexual, and he had a violent criminal history, including robberies of gay men. He had also recently been released from federal prison when Byron was murdered. But police have never named this individual. And even though this accomplice is now deceased, police believe that he is a promising link to the killer. Deputy Chief McConnell says, quote, what this has put us in a position to do is to create a short list of people, associates, family members of this secondary person, and conduct interviews with them to hopefully identify the primary." Unquote. Police say that the two witnesses who came forward do not appear to be connected, and that they both knew details that they could only have heard from someone that had been connected to the crime. Again, talking about why it took so long for one of the witnesses to come forward. Deputy Chief McConnell says, quote, He knew this guy was a dangerous guy, and if he heard that this got out in the public, he didn't want this guy coming looking for him, unquote. Police have no physical evidence that links the accomplice to the murder. However, Deputy Chief McConnell said he has interviewed lots of people who knew this alleged accomplice, and quote, they would find it very odd he would confess to something he didn't do, especially something so sensational as the car murder, unquote. In 2013, Deputy Chief McConnell said the crime scene had shown signs of frustration on the part of the two men. Quote, they came for something and they can't find it. And what we are seeing is some juvenile behavior associated to that and a lot of frustration in these acts." Unquote. One of those acts is the message that was written on the wall. And Deputy Chief McConnell says handwriting analysis has suggested that the message was not actually written by the killer, but was written by his accomplice, after the fact. The gay community, he added in 2013, had also stepped forward to provide valuable information to the police. But despite these developments in the case, no new leads had emerged until July of 2018, when an unidentified man made two phone calls to police in regards to Byron's murder. The calls were made from a payphone in the Charlottetown Mall, and although the man left messages, he didn't provide any contact information and no security cameras in the mall have a view of the payphone, so his identity remains unknown. Deputy Chief McConnell said there was an urgency in this man's tone, which suggested that he wanted to give police information. So in September of 2018, police publicly asked him to get in touch again, but it's unclear if anything else came of this. Also in 2018, police would say that DNA evidence from Byron's murder had deteriorated too much over the years for it to be used in new techniques in the field of genetic genealogy. But it still could be used to eliminate or positively identify suspects. So far though, the DNA believed to be the killers does not match with any other cold case or any other person in the DNA data banks in Canada, the United States, or the United Kingdom. Hundreds of witnesses have been interviewed. Hundreds of people have been eliminated, some of them through DNA and others by confirming alibis. 
One such person who was eliminated early was Ernie Much. He was the guy that hung out with Byron, Ted, and Owen on the last night Byron was alive. Police interrogated, polygraphed, and released Ernie. Now, I could not find out if Ernie's DNA was eliminated, but he was cleared. I assume Ted Gallant and Owen Aylward, who were the last known people to be with Byron that night, must have also been cleared, but I could not find anything of public knowledge. I did see a reporter approach Owen Aylward for an interview in a 1993 documentary, but Owen at that time refused to speak, and he said it was because it was an ongoing investigation. Also, in this documentary, it was stated that police initially believed that they had known who the killer was, but they never had enough evidence to charge him. Now, this documentary was made in 1993, which was just five years after the murder, and as we can see, a lot of developments have come up since then. I do believe that this statement was in reference to a man named Peter Dale MacDonald who was actually once considered a prime suspect in Byron's murder, actually for nearly 20 years. But MacDonald would later be cleared because his DNA did not match the DNA found at the crime scene. As well, it was also determined that MacDonald was in Montreal at the time of the crime. Nonetheless, police say the list of possible suspects that remains in Byron's murder is in the hundreds and tracking them down to eliminate them as possible suspects is very challenging. Many have moved away, and although DNA samples are now routinely obtained for violent and sexual offenders and entered into a national DNA data bank, some possible suspects had done their time before this DNA data bank was set up. Police believe Byron Carr's killer would be in his late 40s to mid 50s today. When it comes to suspects in the murder of Byron Carr, there is not much of public knowledge from the police, but there are rumors that do circulate within the Charlottetown community. The most obvious suspect and someone the police want to identify is the cyclist that Byron was seen talking to that night. This person seemed to follow Byron home, but who was he? Was it just a coincidence or was he the killer? Identifying this man could be a big piece of the puzzle. There is a rumor that exists in Charlottetown that someone with political connections may have covered up Byron's murder. It is alleged that he was having swinging parties with prominent people in the community, one even maybe being a high-ranking police officer. We know that he did tell at least one person about these escapades, I mean, if you can believe this unidentified man. And supposedly, these escapades were being videotaped and there were pictures. Is it possible that someone didn't want this information to get out, so they murdered Byron to shut him up? It's also a mystery why Byron had stolen the $6,000 from his school yearbook committee. What did he need that money for? Does the stolen money have anything to do with Byron's murder, or did Byron just see an opportunity to get away with stealing 6,000 bucks? What about the guy who Byron told his close friend that was phoning him and came in into his house one night while he was asleep on the couch? Though Byron claimed this guy was harmless, he did say that he did not want to be associated with him, and Byron did seem a bit alarmed. Some other people in the community speculate that possibly Byron's murderer was one of his past students. It is interesting that the profile put forth by the police was of a man between the ages of 15 and 25 years old, and that is the right age group to be a former student of Byron's. And then there is the link between Byron's murder and a car theft that happened that same night. The crime was reported by George Smith, who is a man that police have never been able to track down. But whatever this link is, I could not find it. Obviously, police know something that we do not. Now, not a suspect, but a very crucial person that police need to identify in this murder is the female whose DNA was on the underwear found at the scene. Police believe this woman knows the killer well, therefore could identify him. 
that a woman's DNA is in the clothing doesn't mean that she was there that night. It's more likely that her DNA was on the killer's clothing because she knew him well. Quote, Based on the item of clothing, we feel that there was a close personal relationship between both donors. We feel that if we identify this person, there's a good chance that will lead us to the male. Unquote. Deputy Chief McConnell told CBC News in 2008. Police have collected hundreds of DNA samples and ruled out hundreds of suspects over the years, but still, almost 33 years later, Byron's killer has not been caught. The right people are not talking, and the case remains PEI's only unsolved murder. And most sad of all is that Byron's family still has no answers. One piece of information that I did come across while I was researching this case is that in the few years that followed Byron's murder, members of the Carr family were being harassed by anonymous phone calls and break-ins. One time, Maida, Byron's sister, even recalled that a knife that was similar to the one that was used on Byron was left on her balcony. It is way past due that this family gets the answers that they deserve. And anybody with any information regarding this crime, no matter how insignificant it may seem, is asked to call the Alliant Sponsored Byron Carr Hotline at 1-877-566-3952 or PEI Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS.